Welcome to The Restless Politics Leading with me, Rory Stewart. And me, Alistair Campbell. And Governor, thank you very, very much for joining us. Um, I wanted to start with something that fascinates me, which is the way that your life seems to have gone from a childhood, which to us seems like something out of the sound of music, uh, then in another stage of your life to Conan the Barbarian. And I wanted to go back to that childhood a little bit and talk about Austria in the late 40s. And two things, I think. What One is you've sometimes talked about a broken generation, and you've sometimes talked about how the United States represented for you something different, optimism, athletics, Hollywood. Tell us a little bit about the Austria of the late 40s, early 50s. Well, when I was born in 1947, um, it was right after the Second World War. So uh, Austria and Germany, they just lost the war. So I think uh, at that time, I'd never even thought about it because I was a kid. But uh, later on, when I came to America, and I analyzed what was happening in my childhood and having a father that uh, was, you know, every so often drinking and uh, on the, the days, you know, kind of way of thinking it he was an alcoholic and um he uh you know all the men around it were angry they were they felt like losers um they were drinking and they were going through post traumatic stress syndrome and at that time none of that was acknowledged and was talked about uh they just went about their lives and uh so we were kind of like victims of all of that, the kids, not just me, but I mean, the, the neighbor kids and everyone. There was violence around it. We were beaten and, and all of that. And um, so that gave me, I think, the motivation that I wanted to get out of there. I wasn't happy. And it was wonderful because now when I look back, I said to myself, if I wouldn't have had that, maybe I would have stayed in Austria. Maybe I would have been happy there. And then I would have had an ordinary life like my other friends had. Uh, so now I credit actually my father and that upbringing for getting me to America and creating that fire in the belly and to for me to create the visions that I had and the daydreams that I had about them wanting to go to America, wanting to, to be something special and get out of there. And all of that it was kind of uh, a reaction to what well, was going on. One quick thing before I bring in Alistair. Um, sport. So I think for Austria after the war, sport was important. The football team, skiing, people like Tony Seiler from Kitzbühel, uh, later some of the great stars of the 70s. Um, in a sense, your bodybuilding was a form of athletic activity. You, you were a sort of sportsman. Do you think that was a part of you that was Austrian? That's an Austrian culture? Well, not really because... Uh... You know, my father and friends and neighbors, they said to me, he says, you're so energetic about this bodybuilding and weightlifting, but this is not really an Austrian sport. Why don't you do skiing? Why don't you do play soccer or bicycle racing or something like that? Something that is more Austrian. And uh, I somehow couldn't really relate to that. Uh, I said to myself, okay, I, I, I understand it, but I don't want to be an, an uh, ordinary Austrian competing for this stuff. I want to be unique. I want to be different. I want to get to America. I want to do something American. Bodybuilding is an American sport and the British uh, kind of sport because in England, uh, there were great bodybuilding champions like Reg Park that became my idol. He lived in Leeds. And he was training five hours a day and he became great Mr. Great Britain and then became Mr. Europe and Mr. Universe uh, three times, Mr. Universe, as a matter of fact, and then got into movies. And when I was 15 years old, I saw his Hercules movies. So that's what I wanted to be, not a ski racer, not Tony Seiler. And <laughs> so I, I went as fast as I could to, to get to America and then to go and build myself up and become, you know, the, the best bodybuilder of all times. And Arnie, did you, did you ever reconcile the what seems to be quite troubled relationship that you had with both your parents? And also you had the extra tragedy of your brother being killed. He was also, I think, a big drinker being killed in a car crash. So we, when you said you, were, you wanted to get out of there, were you getting away from Austria? Were you getting away from your parents? And did you ever feel that you reconciled it? 
your well, relationship? Uh, first of all, you're absolutely right. I was trying to get away from everything. I just wanted to leave and I wanted to create my own life. So I was extremely happy when I started meeting all these other guys with the age of 15 that went to weightlifting and bodybuilding. And I, I started to adopt that new life. And I felt this was really great because my parents were not into that. So this was my own. I felt like I had just started my own thing that was not my parents' idea. It was not something that my father said I should do or my mother said I should do and all that stuff. So I felt really proud of myself and I felt great. And I had kind of a, a new life, I felt, and it, it motivated me. And uh, then when I went to America and I became very successful in bodybuilding and then in show business and, and everything, uh, when I look back at that now, I say to myself, I'm so glad that I had this kind of upbringing because it's the very thing that drove me, that gave me the fire and the belly, that created all those visions and that willpower and all those things. So I, you know, I speak very fondly of my father always because uh, he did his best that he could. He probably was beaten when he when he grew up, you know. So that was kind of the tradition then, and the, not the day anymore. Austria is a totally different place, you know, politically speaking, economically speaking, and socially speaking, in every way. It has much more um, Americanized, and so uh, you know, now when I go back there, I see a totally different Austria than when I grew up. But uh, you know. Sometimes those obstacles, you know, I know that there's a lot of kids or a lot of grown-ups that run around and they say, well, this is my parents' fault. They did this to me and this is why I have this hang-up. And those. I think this is a bunch of crap because the bottom line is, I think all of this stuff, we, when we grow up, we develop our own brain and our own mind and then we can go in any direction that we want to go. We don't have to kind of suffer through this leftovers. Mm. I mean, you know, to me, I, I love my mother. I love my, my dad and I speak fondly of them and I appreciate what they did for me and I always credit them for having helped me and not making me feel like I'm a self-made man, but they made me and uh, the rest of the people that helped me made me and not myself. Now, you, you, you've, you've just published a book, which Roy and I both read uh, yesterday. Um, I read it on a long train ride through France and I, I enjoyed it. But interestingly, the title, Be Useful, was what your dad used to say to you. Do you think he felt that being a bodybuilder and even being a Hollywood star was not the most useful thing you could do? And was you, do you think you ended up in politics partly because that is a way that actually we can be useful? Well, well, remember, this is a political web, a political podcast. Yeah, yeah. That's why I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> 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 but no, uh, but uh, you hit the nail on the head. Um, my father, when he saw me doing bodybuilding, he immediately criticized it. And he said, you know, why are you doing that? You're just, you know, trying to kind of work on yourself. You only think about your own muscles and your own body and you should look better. And always, why don't you go in order to get stronger? Why don't you go and chop some wood for the neighbor lady that is 80 years old and she cannot chop wood anymore herself. So why don't you do it? Why don't you help her? That's being useful. You know, or shovel some coal for the neighbor. You know, then you get muscles too and you get strong too. So it was this kind of stupid talk that he had uh, to make me feel guilty. Uh, but the bottom line was he meant well because he just said, look, everyone should go out and not just think about themselves, but do something for other people. Now, remember, he was a police officer. He was a gendarme, which is a French word for country police officer, gendarmerie. And so he was a police officer. So he felt that he was, he chose a profession that will help people to provide safety for the people and to help them, you know, to, 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 to feel good and to be protected and all that. And so he felt that he did, he did his job and he wanted his children also to do the same thing. And, uh, you know, but it was the very thing that drove me always hearing this voice behind, kind of behind me saying, be useful, be useful, be useful. What do you think looking at your whole life was the moment where your father w would have really thought, OK, at this moment, my son was really being useful. Which one would he have been most proud of in your life? Well, you know, my father, the, my parents never came to any competition that I competed in. So it was not like the day in America where the kids, where the parents go to see them playing soccer and going to uh, singing recitals and plays and all this kind of stuff for the kids. In those days, they didn't do that. Uh, th I think the only competition 
that my father and my mother went to was a competition in Essen, Germany, which was the Mr. Olympia competition. So for, for some miracle reason, that year Germany got the rights to run the Mr. Olympia competition, which is the top bodybuilding competition where only Mr. Universe is allowed to compete in. And I won that competition and they watched that. And I remember them coming up to me afterwards where we had a party, a dinner with all the champions there. And my parents came up to me and says, we are so proud of you. Wow, I never thought that this is going to develop into this, that you're standing up on stage in front of 5,000 people and you're winning and you're the most muscular man. I mean, your but you dreams... But already, you'd already been doing it for some time by then. So they came yeah, quite but, late but, in but your career. No, no, this was like uh, after... I started in 1962, so this was 10 years after I started with bodybuilding. I won now the third Mr. Olympia competition. The first one was- But, but that was 19... the first one they saw. That's right, that yeah. was the first competition that they saw. And so they freaked out when they saw that, how you know people were screaming and Arnold, Arnold and all that stuff. And you know how I won the competition, got my trophy, and won the cash prize and all of this stuff. So this was a, a, you know kind of something and then right after that, literally like two months after that, my father passed away. And uh, so it was really terrific to see that. And that's when I saw that he he got it finally. That uh, And my mother, of course, uh, is like all of the mothers of famous people that take full credit. <laughs> right? right? Very good. <laughs> I, I tell you, I, I, I remember when uh, we were at the Golden Globes in Beverly Hills at the Beverly Hilton. And there was the mother of Sophia Loren sitting there <laughs> with my mother, and the mother of Sylvester Stallone was sitting there. All the mothers were sitting together there at the Golden Globe Awards, and they all were talking about how they were responsible to make you famous. Sophia Loren's mother said, oh, I pushed her to take photographs with this photographer, and that's what made the photograph, and that was made her very famous. And Stallone says, oh, my son would be such an idiot. He would have been in the school. He would have done nothing. But I pushed him to become an actor because I knew his talent right away when he was a kid. And my mother said, oh, man, I kept pushing my son. I said to him, train harder, train hard. If she didn't believe in training at all. <laughs> you know, so it was very funny to see those three, four women there talking to me. There. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it was really cute and it was very, very funny. When you were a bodybuilder and, then, and also when you were a, a Hollywood star, was there always a part of you that was thinking about politics? No, I, I tell you that what got me really thinking about it was because I started dating Maria. And uh, she was the daughter of Sergeant Shriver, uh, who yeah. started the Peace Corps and the Job Corps, Legal Aid to the Poor, and all of those programs in America under the Kennedy and Johnson administration. Why are you not a Democrat? You, you married into the most famous Democrat political clan in the world, and you're not a Democrat. When you marry a Democrat, that doesn't mean that you have to always sit and start throwing <laughs> out your philosophy and then become a Democrat. I mean, this is, was not my style. I mean, I was a committed Republican, and I was very, very happy to marry a Democrat and to marry into a Democratic family because I, I got a really a lot of knowledge about the other side. And so that was very important to me. And I think that when you talk about politics, it was really never something that I thought about until I started listening to Sergeant Shriver, to Maria's mother, that always talked about service, always how do we help people? How do we go and make lives better for the kids? How do we make it better for minorities and uh, for people that, you know, make no money and that have that are poor? And, uh, you know, how do we create legal aid for them and all of this kind of stuff? So you always talked about policy and about helping people. And I just thought that was fascinating. I thought that was so good. It was really interesting to have a life where you just occupy yourself with that subject. I think that rubbed off on me. And so I started hearing more and more about politics and about running and this and that. And then I started working in 1990 for George Bush when he was president. From, he was See, president George from Bush 1989 Senior. to 1993. And so I, he asked me to be the chairman of the President's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports. So I spent a lot of time with him at Camp David. He invited me a lot of times to Camp David on the weekends and then also to the White House. And uh, I, he included me a lot of times in meetings that he had with various different groups of people and others. And I just thought that it was so inspirational to see him at work 
and to make a difference in America. And uh, so uh, that kind of all of that, being with the Shrivers and being now with Bush, I think inspired me and started making me think, wouldn't it be cool to have it somewhere down the line? I don't know when. I was in the middle of my acting career and it was the top star at that point. I said, wouldn't it be cool one day to get into politics myself? One of the things I resonated with, so I, I came into politics without being a professional politician. And when I was reading your book and seeing some of these documentaries, I felt when I took over for the first time as a, you know, uh, a cabinet minister and I suddenly had this $20 billion a year budget and I felt like a bit of imp an imposter. I felt this is an impossible job. I'm dealing with so many unbelievably complicated things. The policy decisions are unbelievable. And I think you were quite reflective about this, your first day in the job, just suddenly getting a sense of just how crazy what you expect a governor to be responsible for and think about. Well, it was uh, it was an eye opener. You know, it's always one thing when you jump into a race, and then to go, and all of a sudden, I felt like, oh, this is like a competition, like going for the Mr. Olympia competition or Mr. Universe competition. It's like, uh, how do you wipe out your competitors? So it was fun to go on a campaign trail and to talk to the people and to take the pictures and go to fundraisers and to do all the kind of things that get you up there and to, to, to finally win. Uh, but then when you sit in there in that office, my wife always said, I think you're a fantastic campaigner. I think you're great politically, but I think that you will really hate policy. And uh, the funny thing was that quite the opposite happened because I started really learning about all these various different subjects. And this is why I always say that the capital uh, in Sacramento that the capital became kind of a university for me because I learned so much about the various different issues. You know, there you are at nine in the morning, you're sitting there with the teachers' union and you talk about, you know, better pay and uh, benefits for the teachers. Then uh, an hour later, the prison guard union comes in and they're talking about their issues. Then the nurses' union comes in and they talk about their issues, issues that I never even heard about. I mean, it's like they said to me, we have to have, instead of a six to one, a four to one ratio. And I leaned over to my, to my assistant and said, what the hell are they talking about racial here? You know, and then I found out and they were explaining it to me, you know, that it is now six uh, patients to one nurse and they want to have only four patients to one nurse and all this stuff. And it all made sense all of a sudden to me. So it was like one meeting after the other was a great, great education. And, and what was your style? Are you quite a quick decision maker or are you somebody who likes to take the papers away, think for two weeks before you make decisions? Do you make decisions on the spot? Are these people leaving the office with you saying, OK, I'm going to do four to one for you? Well, I was a decision maker that kind of took in information from the left and from the right. And I think because you talk about not having been in politics before, I think one of my advantages was I didn't come in as a political hack, so to speak, you know, where I felt like total loyalty to my party. So I made decisions a lot of times that made sense to me, even though I was a conservative thinking and person. And you, you make them quickly or you take time? Not quickly, you know, I listened to my team and we talked about it. Then we had meetings, follow-up meetings. Then we figured out how to be compromised and maybe uh, do something a little bit different, but still kind of move the thing forward. You know, so that okay. someone will come in and says, we want to have a you know, minimum wage, $15 an hour. And we will say, well, let's do a gradual increase over a period of five years. And so we came up with ways to negotiate and stuff like that. But what was my advantage was that I had not just Republicans uh, giving me advice, but I also had Democrats giving me advice. There's a very interesting section in your book where you talk about that, where your chief of staff was somebody recognized as a Democrat. You, you were very clear about when you were appointing judges that there had to be a kind of political balance. And that feels right to me, but it feels completely dissonant with the sort of politics that we have in the United States right now, which feels really polarized. Now, first of all, how worried are you about the state of US politics and what do we do to try and reverse some of this polarization? Well, I think that uh, I was always a big believer that the entire United States represented by Democrats and Republicans and declined to state and independence. We don't have six parties or anything like that, but uh, you know we have different views. And I feel like that if we all work together, that we are the most powerful nation in the world. I'm concerned if we continuously go 
when the Democrats take over, they, they only hire Democrats and have only Democrats make decisions. And when the Republicans take over the White House or Congress, then only Republicans make the decision. So to me, this is only half of the brain power each time. And so I feel that it is very important that we teach our politicians to kind of work together and do not look at each other as the enemy. Uh, because just someone thinks differently and has a different political philosophy does not make them an enemy because they're still American. And so I feel like kind of like since I get to learn my lessons from sports, in sports when you have a team, you know, my weightlifting team when we competed, no one asked what your political affiliation was. We competed as a team and there were liberals and conservatives on this weightlifting team and they came from different backgrounds. Some of them was farmers, some of them were, you know, factory workers, sons, and some of them were, you know, sons of teachers. So they were different kind of things. So it's so stupid that we argue and we look at each other as the enemy rather than working together. And I just think that I had the advantage of doing that and I saw firsthand how it is possible. Yes, the Republicans were up in arms when I said that I have Susan Kennedy as my chief of staff. They said, well, she's gay. I said, so what? I said, I don't go around asking people what the sexual uh, orientation is or what they prefer to do in bed. I said, it's none, none of my business. Sure. I said, and then I said, they said, well, she's a Democrat. I said, so what? I said, but when I look at her memos, and when I talk to her, she talks exactly the language that I talk, and she wants to improve the state, and she wants to do something great for people. So I'm going to go with her. I said, you're not going to tell me who I choose. I said, it's the governor's job to choose his uh, chief of staff. So it was something to, for them to get used to, uh, but, uh, you know, we worked it out, and it was fine. So, so you, you were born in 1947, and you're, you're getting older, and you're looking at two presidential candidates, presumably President Biden and presumably Donald Trump going to the next election, who are older than you. What what do you think about people of that age running? What have you learned from getting older? What would you be worried about, about people going into their 80s doing a job of that kind of stress? Well, first of all, I would not put everyone in the same pot, you know, because there are people that I know that are 96 years old and are still actively involved in business and making decisions and they're very sharp. And then there's people that are age 70 and they're really slowing down and they're very forgetful and they're very fragile. So you cannot put everyone in the same pot. But what I see right now is that we have uh, people that are too old and because of that are slowing down with their energy and with their creativity. And that's what's going on in America. I think that we should have a new generation. I feel that the people that are in power now have created the problem that we're in. And as Einstein said, that the same mind that created the problem is not able to solve it. And so therefore, I believe that we need a new generation to come in and to solve those problems. Who, who, would, who would you vote for between Biden and Trump? Oh, I have no idea um, about that because I don't see Trump as an alternative at this point because he still have, has too many legal problems. And we don't even know that is he really in fact running or can he go and run all the way to the end. So I right now only think that he maybe will win the, the Republican nomination because he definitely has the highest poll numbers. Uh, so I think he will get there, but I think that he can really run. I still question that. What is the danger to America if Donald Trump were to return to the White House. How would you define that as a, as a real and present danger? Well, I don't see it as a danger because I just don't see it possible. So therefore, I don't even have to debate that issue. Uh, I don't see it possible. First of all, I don't see it possible because of his legal problems. And second of all, I don't see it possible because he right now has 33% of the people voting uh, or being on his side and you need over 50 percent to win the election. So for you know being in, ahead of the in the Republican category, I is totally understandable. I see that that that's a, a fact that he's the head of uh, the, the main guy there and uh, he's the monster there. but I mean, uh, that does not really translate into a victory of all. Governor, one of the things that's very striking when you talk is you often seem to be very, very positive about people. 
a lot of your personal narrative is about praising bodybuilders who were mentors to you or wrestlers that you got to know or other actors. But presumably there are also people that you dislike. And I'd be interested in what kind of character traits anger you, what kind of people you disapprove of, what kind of politicians. You don't have to name names, but what character types do you not like? Well, first of all, I don't really give a shit, right? But I don't get mad or angry at anyone. I don't get hateful about anyone. People can be different and all that stuff. But let me just say in general, I'm very disappointed at politicians, period. Because as a whole, they want to get elected. They want to get reelected. They want to protect their position and their job. And for that, they sometimes act like cowards. They don't want to take on any kind of challenging kind of things. They don't want to go and tackle the high-hanging fruits, only the low-hanging fruits, things that are easy to do. And uh, it's because of a lack of lack of courage. And they talk a lot of times when they go to you know, military events or something like that. Oh, look how brave the soldiers are. They're risking their lives. And then go to the funeral of a firefighter and they say, they are so brave, they're risking their own lives to save others. And then those politicians are not even willing to risk their position to make the right decision. And to me, that is very disappointing. And so this is why I would say overall, politicians should really think about more being a public servant than a party servant, because that's the important thing. And by the way, I know that you worked for Player. Um, and um, I just want you to know that he was an extraordinary man because uh, I didn't know him well, but he came over to California and he gave a speech about the environment. And I loved his speech and his talk so much that I went to him and I said to him, I said, could you please help me? And he says, we what? And I said, we are about to really create great environmental policy in California. But I said, the Democrats still have a problem with our cap and trade, an idea that you guys, that you actually uh, developed in Europe. And uh, he said to me, he says, who do you want me to talk to? And I said, well, he's right here. I said, he's a good friend of mine, Fabian Nunez. He's the speaker of the assembly. I said, but he still has a problem getting it across to his constituents. So he sat down with him and he talked to him about the big plus and he promised him that he will send his best guy to Sacramento and will teach us how to write the bill so that they, we don't make the same mistakes that they made in England or in Europe in general, because he said this was a new idea and he said, we made some mistakes, he said, and I think they can be straightened out by making some alteration to the bill. He says, so let me send someone over. And he did. And because of Tony Blair, we passed a most effective cap and trade bill that actually reduced our pollution, our greenhouse gases by 25% and created 50% of renewable energy and the million solar roof initiative and all that stuff. And it was because of Tony Blair's help. And he didn't look at me like, oh, he's a Republican. I don't want to help him. No, he was interested in helping the state of California and therefore helping the world because California is the fifth largest economy in the world. So I will never forget that. So, you know, we maybe don't agree on all the different policies as a but he was a very kind and generous man that was willing to work with someone like me and, uh, you know, and, and, and help me. That's why, I mean, look, it's no secret to Rory or any of our listeners that I'm <laughs> still a great friend of Tony Blair's and think he was a great prime minister. And I was, I'm glad you said that, not because just because it was Tony, because your answer before that, I think, worried me a little because you're somebody who's known the inside of politics and how hard it is. And yet you were essentially saying almost like that all politicians are bad. Because, Not you know, all. They don't do I, didn't say, no. I didn't say all. No, I know, but that was I the impression. In general, I said politicians have this behavior of mm. not being bad, but just being cowards a lot of times mm. and not really being able to make the tough decisions. So it's not, not all. There's a lot of them that are different. Maybe give us another couple of, of politicians that you've worked with or that you know, or that we know that you admire and tell us why. 
Well, for instance, Ronald Reagan. I didn't work with him, but uh, I uh, was a big admirer of him. And uh, President Nixon uh, was the one that actually, when I moved uh, to America in 1968, was running for president against H Hubert Humphrey. And when I listened to Hubert Humphrey, it sounded to me like I'm listening to some politician in Austria, you know, kind of socialism. <laughs> and uh, it was the he, government is the solution. Sure. You know, and I said to myself, well, I love what Ronald Reagan said. And what Nixon said is that government is the problem. And that this is really get the government off your can, back. Can I, can I ask you, Governor? You you can't be president of the United States because the Constitution doesn't allow you to. I know you would like to be, but you can't be. But why not become Chancellor of Austria? Austria would love to have you back. You're a big star in Austria. It's your country, you, as well as America being your country. Yeah, you have two countries. Why not go back and be a great Austrian politician? I think they have a good chancellor there, and uh, I don't want to go back to Austria and be a politician in Austria. No, not at all. I, uh, why, the, why, why not? Tell me. I, I, just, I just feel like I want to live in America I want to live in California, and um, you know that's where my home is. And I love always going back to Austria. So, matter of fact, after this trip, I go back to Austria uh, and to visit. There's a museum now there, the Schwarzenegger Museum, sure. where it was actually the home where I grew up. And uh, you know, this has all the various different movie memorabilia there, and the motorcycle from Terminator, and the desk, the, the governor's desk, and all of the stuff is there. So it's a wonderful place, and has like hundreds of visitors coming every day. It's really very, very popular. But to do politics there, there no, I, I, I have no desire to do that, and um, and uh, so I want to stay in America. And I want to go and be helpful there. And I always tell people, even though I cannot run for president, but whoever is our next president, I tell everyone always is that I'm always available if anyone needs any help. Doesn't matter if they're Democrats or Republicans, I'm there to help. And is the thing that you've done in your life that you're most proud of being governor? Is that the thing that is the... I'm most proud of that. But I tell you, the thing that I'm really proud of myself is uh, that... I was able to recognize that life is not just about me, that life is about helping other people. And that's what I talk about in a book also. And you got, because there, you got then, there later in life? I, 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 yeah, it was like, well, I always had a, a, a trace. I always was very happy, happy to help other bodybuilders and stuff like that. But I remember it started with Special Olympics when I was asked to do a study for Special Olympics for people that are intellectually challenged. And to go and to go to this university and to study what effect weight training would have on those Special Olympians. And I had the most wonderful time teaching them for three days. And I was so happy afterwards. And I said to myself, why am I so happy? I mean, I'm, I, it's not a career move uh, that I made here. I didn't make any money. Why am I happy? And I found out it was because I was giving something back. I was doing something to make other people feel good, to hug them and to, get, to give them medals and to start creating the powerlifting championships for Special Olympics. Then I started traveling all over the world to promote Special Olympics. And then eventually I became the chairman of the President's Council on Physical Fitness under President Bush. And then I started after school programs. And one thing led to the next, and it always became addictive to give something back and to do something for people that eventually I ran for governor. And so to me, I think to have that side of you that wants to reach out and help and to recognize that I was not a self-made man, but I was a creation of millions of people. I mean, there was 5.8 million people that voted for me for governor, so I didn't make myself governor. They made me governor. There's millions of people. You know, I did not make myself a movie star. It's the movie fans from all over the world that made me the big movie star. And so on and on and on, like yesterday, I was in the Royal Albert Hall, right? Uh, which, there was, which we've played. We it, love the Royal Albert Exactly. Yeah, so there yeah. was, but it was packed. It was packed. And there was, uh, you know, an interviewer there, so imagine if I would just think that I'm a self-made man, that I'm sitting there by myself with an <laughs> empty hall. It would be ludicrous, right? So this is why I always say it's the people that make you, that give you the power. My last question is this. You've been very, very famous for a long, long time. 
and you've in a way known three different sorts of fame. I didn't realize until I watched your recent documentary just how big a thing the whole you made the bodybuilding sport. I just didn't realize that it was huge. So that was a that was an extraordinary fame. You then reached this kind of fame that we all know, which is we, we don't know, but we know of, which is Hollywood fame. And again, I didn't know until I saw that documentary that you were making the sorts of money that no other film stars were were making at the time. And then you've known political fame. What what if what are the what's been the difference in those three? The very different sorts of fame. Well, you know, I feel like there's a different stages in my life. Uh, it's almost kind of like, you know, a little kid playing with a little choo-choo train, and then. Uh, you grow up and you're, you're like now 15 years old and all of a sudden this choo-choo train, you look at it and you laugh at it. says, can you imagine I was at this age where I still played with this choo-choo train? <laughs> and so you grow up. And the same I feel with this. I, I, you know, I, but there was a time where I looked at bodybuilding and I said to myself, can you believe I'm standing up there on stage with these little posing trunks oiled up and uh, saying to the world, look, I'm the most perfectly developed man in the world. You know, so it sounded like ridiculous to me. Uh, all of a sudden, and so I started getting into acting, and still supporting bodybuilding. I still, you know, hold the bodybuilding competitions, the world championships every year, the Arnold's Classic in various different continents all over the world to promote for a sp a sport and fitness and and weight training and all that stuff. But it, I grew out of it, uh, you know. At the twenty, at the age of twenty eight, all of a sudden I was out of it, and I was interested and in, kind of like fascinated with the idea of learning how to act and become a leading man in movies. And then all of a sudden you grow out of that and you say to yourself, is this all there is in life where I just say those lines that someone writes and then perform and say, I'll be back and ask the Vista baby <laughs> and put the cookie down and get to the chopper, you know, and all of those kind of lines. Is that what... He asked the Lavista baby. Yeah. So yeah, that was that was Boris Johnson's last word as prime minister as before he left Parliament. <laughs> right, right, that was the yeah. last thing he said. <laughs> as La Vista. Uh, but anyway, I always say I'll be back, right? <laughs> but in any case, so I said, is this all there is? And then all of a sudden you get hungry for the next thing in life, which is to be a public servant. And so this is I it you know, it reminds me kind of like um, you know, on, on Hillary who climbed Mount Everest. And uh, I always loved his line when they said, after he came back down, they said, what was it like being up there on the highest mountain in the world? And he looked around and he says, well, when I looked around, I saw another peak. And then I said to myself, okay, I have to figure out how to climb that peak. So he right away went for the next thing. And so I think this is what to me makes life. That's why I love doing that movie back in the 70s called Stay Hungry, because I always was hungry for more and for different things. And I never was satisfied with just being too long with the same thing or doing for the rest of my life the same uh, life the same thing. And I think this is the great thing about you guys. I mean, you guys have been involved in politics and now you switched over to go and communicate to people and to bring them very interesting and fascinating stories and interesting and different personalities and stuff like that. And that's very difficult to do. People have to understand that. It's really tough when you get to a certain age to all of a sudden switch profession. But it is spicy. It makes you start thinking in a different way again. It makes you preparing for it in a different way. Obviously, you have to learn something new. I think that more people should do that. But people are so afraid of, you know, when they get too old, they feel like, oh, I cannot change now and all this stuff. It's bogus. I think you should always search for your passion. What do you love to do? And then go after and chase that. Um, I must tell you, I did, a, I did um, a session in a college recently where, which was a communications masterclass. And the video that I showed them and that we talked through was the one that you did uh, about Ukraine. Uh, I picked that as my most recent communications masterclass. I thought that was an extraordinary piece of communication. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Governor. That was very kind of you. Lovely to see you. Great privilege. Thank, thank you, you very again. much. Thank Keep you, up the good work, guys. Okay. Thank you. Thank so you. I'm proud of you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.